theology. Um, I like to read a quote from Ellen Weiss regarding music. The history of the songs of the Bible is full of suggestion as to the uses and benefits of music and song. Music is often perverted to serve purposes of evil, and it thus becomes one of the most alluring agencies of temptation. But, rather than boy, it is a precious gift of God designed to uplift the thoughts to high and noble themes, to inspire and elevate the soul. Our desire this evening is not to bring glory to ourselves, but use music to elevate Christ. So, as we begin, I'd like to have another word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for traveling mercies. Thank you for the gift of music. Lord, we are frail human beings, and our worship to you must be very faulty. But Lord, we ask you to forgive us. You cover us with the blood of Christ, and you wash us clean like snow, Lord. We pray this evening, the music you perform may invite your angels to abide with us, and also, most importantly, your Holy Spirit into our hearts. Please change us in Jesus' name.
Well, good evening. It's so good to be here at the Fresno Seventh-day Adventist Church. I want to thank the pastor for the invitation. I was here in 2001 when Elder Jerry Page was president and uh, Stephen Bohr was still pastor of this church. And don't let this baby face fool you. And uh, I, was, I was canvassing here. So I, I've knocked on, or I was leading a canvassing team. We've knocked on a bunch of doors here in Fresno. It was a moving experience. So when I think of Fresno, it's always warm memories. Well, before we have a, a short reflection from, from scripture, I invite you to pray with me. Father in heaven, thank you for your people that have gathered together this evening uh, to seek your face, to be uplifted by sacred music, and to spend a few moments to reflect on heavenly themes. So we pray for your Holy Spirit to attend us tonight. Lord, you know that my feet are made of clay, and I pray that you would use this weak vessel for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. A number of years ago, I had the privilege of traveling to West Africa. I took some time uh, during my college years and went to Cameroon, West Africa, and it's something about my blood type. Mosquitoes love me. And uh, I can be in a room, no one else is being bitten, and they're just swarming all over me. Anyone here like that? And so I was getting chewed up this whole mission trip. There were even mosquitoes at the airport. Couldn't believe it. Swatting myself with to spend the night there. Welts all over my body. Finally, I come back to the States. And it was around December. Blue-like symptoms, and there was a something going around campus at the time, so I naturally assumed it was the cold or the flu or something like that. And I'm your typical, na uh, your typical male. I'm allergic to needles and nurses, even to this day. My wife has to schedule doctor's appointments for me because I can't go on my own. So I wait about six days, having all kinds of complications, and finally get this impression you need to go to the emergency room tonight. Tonight. It was like Friday night. So I get bundled up. My parents take me to the emergency room. And fortunately, that evening, there was a physician on call that had been to Africa. He had actually practiced in Africa. And he took one look at me and he said, David, I'm not even going to wait for the blood test to come back because it could take three or four days. In my estimation, you could be dead because I think you have malaria. And a very quick education on what malaria was, a mosquito bites you and they leave a gift. How nice. They leave a parasite in your bloodstream and it incubates in your liver. And then they go into your red blood cells and, and that red blood cell bursts. I had a strain of malaria called falciparum and sometimes it kills you after seven days. It had been six days. And there I was, 19 years of age, and I'm thinking, it could be over. My parents, if you know anything about Korean mom, she's looking at me, and I'm like, I feel worse for her than I do me. And it's just like this whole thing going on, and I'm thinking, it could be over. And he said, even if you make it, you may have to be on keep dialysis for the rest of your life, you may have liver failure, and, and this is not good. They put me on quinine for a number of days, I'm hallucinating, obviously I made it. But here's the thing, there's something that happens to you when you think you're gonna die. When you think that you have hours, maybe minutes, maybe days left, Something happens. There's no fog. Your priorities crystallize. And this is why Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 2, it's better to, the go, to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting. Why? Is it because Solomon is this melancholy, morbid individual that just likes seeing death? No. 
Now, if you were to ask me, I'd rather get a wedding invitation than a notice of a funeral. How many of you like that? I'd much rather go to a wedding than a funeral. But Solomon says it's better to go to a funeral than a wedding. Because he says, but the living will take it to heart. The living will take it to heart. In other words, when you go to a funeral, you suddenly recognize you're mortal. You're not going to live forever. And a good exercise for us to do is to actually grapple with our own mortality, with our own limitation. And the reality is that all of us in this room have an expiration date. You know, you go to the supermarket and you pick up a carton of milk, there's an expiration date. All of us are terminal. There's an expiration date. The Lord only knows when that expiration date is, and sometimes it's actually a blessing to know that you have terminal disease. That's the silver lining, because you can get your house in order. Now, there's something that happens when you recognize that your, your life is terminal. I minister to young people, and for a few years, I did youth ministry and uh, to teenagers. It was, a, it was a challenging part of my life because I came out of the ivory tower, just graduated from the seminary, and I was doing baptismal studies with 10-year-olds. And I was like, Lord, what have I done? There's something, something must have gone wrong. But it was the best time in my life looking back because I had to take these theological concepts and make them simple. And so one of the things I would do is this exercise with young people. I said, let's say you're going on a transatlantic flight across the ocean. And the pilot comes over the airways and says, ladies and gentlemen, have you ever noticed these pilots? They all sound the same. Very mellow, very calm. And maybe even in this scenario, you say, ladies and gentlemen, I have bad news. Due to some mechanical failures, we're going to crash into the Atlantic Ocean. Ten minutes till impact. Use it well. And I ask these hormone-infused teenagers in which their frontal lobe's not working and the elevator doesn't go to the top all the time. I'm like, why are you doing that? They said, I don't know. And so I asked them, you're on the plane. What would you do with the last 10 minutes of your life? I said, how many of you would want to watch a movie for the last 10 minutes of your life? Not one hand went up. I said, how many of you want, want to play video games for the last 10 minutes of your life. Not one hand went up. I said, how many of you ladies would want to go to the bathroom and check your hair, put, put, check your makeup, because you want to die pretty? Not a single hand went up. And I said, what would you want to do? And they said, I'd want to call somebody. I said, who'd you want to call? They said, I'd want to call my parents. I said, isn't that something? 10 minutes left to live. And a teenager wants to call their parents? And I said, what would you say? All of them knew what to say. Three words. I love you. I said, oh, isn't that something? You know exactly who to call and what to say. And I said, what else would you do? They said, I would pray. And I would say to them, isn't it interesting that right now, the two entities that are at the bottom of your priority list, God and your parents, suddenly at the end of your life, take the highest place. Blaise Pascal put it this way, I've learned to define life backwards and live it forward. In other words, if you're going to live your life with what's really important, do the exercise of Solomon. Go to the end of your life in your mind and your priorities suddenly come bubbling to the top. You know what is essential and what's important. And if you're going to climb a ladder, you don't get to the top of the ladder and say, oh, wrong wall, 
No, before you climb the ladder, you make sure it's up against the right wall. And there's many people in life, they climb the ladder, they're very efficient, they get to the top and they realize there's nothing there because it's the wrong wall. Define life backwards and live it forward. I was in graduate school in 2001, believe it or not. And uh, yeah, grad school. And I remember when September 11 happened. Anyone here remember that? You remember where you were? Remember I was at Andrews University I was on that strip, about to go into James White lab Library, and someone told me school has been canceled. There's been a terrorist attack, and I went to Pioneer Memorial Church in the youth room, and I was watching on the projector that ominous picture of smoke billowing out the side of the North Tower. 10 years later, on StoryCorps, they did this audio documentation of the survivors of September 11, those that were left behind, the widows, the orphans. And there was one account that broke my heart. She said that day started like any other day. She got up, kissed her husband goodbye. He worked in one of the Twin Towers. Later on, got a phone call. It was her husband. She said, he said, honey, turn on the television. She turned it on, smoke billowing out the side, and he said, I'm above the expo explosion. I've tried every exit. I don't think I'm gonna make it. And she talks about how, for a few minutes, they were on the phone spending this, this precious time with each other, knowing that death was imminent. And she said after a while, they didn't know what to say. All they would say was, I love you. I love you. I love you. And she said she wished she could crawl through the phone lines and hold her husband during those last moments. And click. He was gone. She said she didn't want to go to bed that night. Because as long as she stayed awake, she felt like it was her last day with her husband. If we only had five minutes left to live, it said that all of us would be on their phones with our loved ones, telling them that we love them. God and people. God and people. When you crystallize it down, that's what it's really about. I was talking to a group of academy students a couple weeks back, and I asked them, hey, when were you born? They're like, 2005. <clears throat> I was like, oh, okay. I said, 2005. And let's say you're a good Seventh-day Adventist, you follow the health message, you live to 2090. Mm, that's a good life, 2009. 2005 to 2090. And let's say the Lord Jesus doesn't come, and I pray he does before then. 2005, 2090. I said, hey, isn't that a pretty good life? That's a pretty good life, huh? And, and how do you want that dash to be? Look at your tombstone, imagine it. It's all there, nice granite stone in an opulent cemetery somewhere, groomed nicely, your tombstone, 2005 to 2090 dash. And I said, that dash represents your life. Kind of traumatic thing. I mean, we're feeding them sushi and boba. They're like, mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. I said, sorry, indigestion. What do you want that dash to be? You want it to be, oh, I went, got a nice job, I went to Loma Linda, hmm? 
became a medical doctor, drove an SUV, white picket fence, golden retriever, had a couple kids. No, I went to church, threw a couple bucks in the offering plate. Nice nest egg, 401k, traveled in Europe, and you die. I said, how many of you think that's all right? And they're all thinking. And I said, let's do a different exercise. Let's say you're gonna die in five years. And you know in 2009, April, it's over, and you know five years. I said, how would you live your life? And you know what they said? I'd be a missionary. And I said, you'd be a what? They said, I'd be a missionary. I said, why? Because I want to live for something greater than myself. And I was like, hey, what's the difference between five years and 90 years? or 85, or whatever it is, or even 100. The difference is, you think you can have your cake and eat it too, but suddenly you're limited with five, and you want to live it for something greater than yourself. But in the end, whether it's five, 10, 50, or 100 years, it's still terminal. And true happiness comes from living for living with those two entities as our highest priority, God and people. When you boil it all down, Solomon says, go to the end of your life, figure out what the values and priorities are, and you live your life accordingly. I was in a ministerial meeting in a Michigan conference, and one of the pastors got up he said, I want to give a testimony that my wife is a prayer warrior. And she was praying to God before she went to bed. And she said, Lord, show me your heart. I want to see your heart. Please show me the heart of God. She fell asleep. While she was sleeping, she had a dream. And in this dream, she was inside the city of the New Jerusalem. It was after the millennium, and she could see through the transparent gold walls. And she's there in the wonder of the celestial city, just in awe, and she's looking out on the horizon in her dream, and she sees a shadow that's covering the whole horizon and it's moving very rapidly toward the city. And she looks, and as the shadow gets closer, she can see that it's people, a host of people coming very rapidly toward the city. And she could make out the faces of the people that are coming, and there's one face that gripped her heart. It was her son. Her son was outside of the city, and she was on the inside. And she says, in this dream, she's breaking down with emotion, recognizing that her son is lost. But she's saved, and she's, she's inside the city, and she said, in the dream, her son comes to the walls of the New Jerusalem, puts his hands on the walls, and she's looking through the walls at her son, and it, her son is saying something. And she could make out, she couldn't hear him, but she could make out what she, he's saying by reading his lips, and this is what he's saying. He's saying, Mom, Mom, let me in. Let me in. And she's, she's breaking down crying, and she turned to try to let him in. She realized she couldn't, and she heard the voice, the time has come, and she woke up. And she could sense the voice of God speaking to her and saying, now you know my heart. Now you know my heart. Friends, every day, 
People are expiring and dying. And even though we don't believe that when we die, we go directly to heaven, we don't believe in the immortal soul, we do believe that death is asleep. And here's the thing, from the standpoint of the person that has died, let's say I'm going down the freeway, semi-truck, doesn't see me, boom. All right? So from my standpoint, this is how it goes. All right? From my standpoint, I miss my funeral, I miss the flowers, I miss all the nice things that people say about me. I miss all that. Okay? Ah! Then, it's one of two realities. One reality is. Dun, dun, dun. You're like, ah! Huh? What? <gasps> I must have died. <laughs> Praise God. God, I'm on the right side. That's one scenario. All right? That's the scenario you want to be. So I tell young people, if you, you, you're disoriented and you hear trumpets and you look up, you're like, hey, you died. You died. But you woke up in the right place. That's what I tell them. Or if it's like this. Ah! Ooh. New Jerusalem. That looks... He's got must. That looks like Hitler. Oh, that is Hitler. Mussolini, Genghis Khan, Julius Caesar. Oh, that looks like that is the devil. Oh. <laughs> the New Jerusalem, thousand years later, that's the reality. So every day, people are expiring and they're waking up from their vantage point in one reality or the other. And we have the unique opportunity here and now, while our hearts are still beating, while there's still, our lungs are still taking in oxygen, and we're still in our right minds, to number one, determine whether we're right with God. Amen? Amen. And number two, to make sure that as many people on planet Earth that we have interaction with, our friends, families, loved ones, neighbors, whoever it may be, are waking up if they expire in the first resurrection and not the second one. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. This life is a probationary life. It's a vapor. Goes like that. And it's determined where we're going to spend eternity. If Elon Musk comes to us and says, look, if you give me your penny, I'll deposit directly into your bank account a billion dollars right now. Would you do it? You better believe it. And yet God says, give me your penny in exchange for eternity. And we're like, oh, I have my 1976 polished penny. Mm. I don't know, Lord. Don't call me. I'll call you. We've been duped into this reality. And yet, today is the day of salvation. Amen? How many of you want to say, by the grace of God, Lord, help me to live for you. Amen? Amen. And help me to ensure that as many people are there in the first resurrection. Amen. Help us by your grace. Pray with me. Father in heaven, you've seen these hands. Lord, we need help. We've been distracted by the world, by the allurements, by the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye. Help us not to sell out and to exchange for the things of this world, the eternal. So wake us up, whatever it takes, Lord. Save us by your grace. For we ask these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
designed to teach students to serve others through music. Music is a calling from God. Music is part of my DNA, is who I am. Music is a way to express. To express thoughts and feelings, very deep ones. It's how we communicate the things that can't be spoken, but that also can't remain silent. And most importantly, it's a way in which I can glorify God and a way in which I can worship Him. I chose Weimar University for the sole reason that I realize the true value of Christ-centered education and Christ-centered music. It is a place where I can receive an education that is mission-focused, not necessarily performance-focused like many other options that I was looking at. Right now it is the only uh, school that tries to follow the blueprint of true education that has a music program. Our performance ensembles have many opportunities to share the work that we do here. Last year we had our university orchestra traveling to Japan and this year we have our choir going to New Zealand to reach others. Among those things we also have opportunity to reach people in our community through our TCI program as well as opportunity to reach people that come and visit our campus that are participating in the New Start and the Depression Recovery Program. And the students who are involved in the music program get to actually interact with these patients and serve them. So you have tons of playing experience. You get to touch so many lives. After I leave Weimar, I might be a music teacher. I also might be a concert pianist. They also may be able to be a composer and compose music that uplifts God and brings healing to the mind and the spirit. What we want to do is open the door for those who study this um, uh, main area of study of evangelism and be able to connect our musicians to churches to be music ministers. There are so many options. We'll see where God leads. The music program is accredited. You will graduate with an accredited degree at Weimar University. You should choose Weimar University if you're looking for a Christ-centered education. If God is calling you to be a Weimar, you should be here. Ours is not only Christ-centered, but it's going back to that original blueprint that was entrusted to us to share so that we may be effective as we share the three angels' message to a dying world by using your music and your voice that God has given you uniquely to create, to reform, and to heal a hurting world. It is a foregone conclusion that we can say that our lives, especially in the 21st century, is going at 100 miles per hour plus all the time. It's hard, isn't it, to sometimes set aside an evening just to stop. Sabbath is one thing. God has given us that gift. But during the week, it's hard. But you've taken the time tonight to stop and pause. And we need to do that. Because when we pause, when we set the noise of life aside, that's when God can penetrate. He tries to penetrate during the day, and he's always with us. He's always walking with us. But oh, to hear that still, small voice. And tonight, we hope that you've heard that through the music presented. You know, all of us are invited to our very special choir rehearsal. Did you know that? All of us, all of you. So many people, I, I'm one of the voice teachers on campus, 
And so many people, first thing they come to me and tell me is, um, I really can't sing. No, you can. You want to know why? Because when God created us, he created us with something very special, an instrument. The only instrument God ever created is what? The voice. All of us. And we can develop those gifts, even if we don't believe that's been given to us as a natural gift. All of us can. Because all of us have the same pair of vocal cords. And even if you don't use it here on earth in the way you think you can, we all will use it in heaven. I guarantee it. Because in Revelation, it tells us that when we arrive to that wonderful great marriage supper, we will sing the song of the Lamb. Now, has anyone here ever heard the tune of the song of the Lamb that Revelation is talking about? Anybody know the tune? No? I don't. So what does that mean? You got to come to choir rehearsal. And what a day that will be because the Lamb himself will be our conductor. He will teach us the song of the Lamb, and we will resound together with an incredible joyful noise, with our brothers and sisters, with Adam. We'll get to hear him sing. With Moses, with Elijah. Imagine that day. What a glorious day. But until that day, we live in a world that is enveloped in darkness. But with the arm of the gospel of music... We can bring light to the world. You know, music has the power to disarm. A lot of times you go to people and tell, come to an evangelistic meeting, come and hear the pastor, and usually it's like, no. But you tell them, come to a concert, and usually they'll come with you. They may not hear the gospel in spoken word, but they'll hear it in the words of wonderful, great, sacred anthems and hymns of our heritage and history, of our faith. And that it is through the darkness Right? That we were able to emerge triumphant with Christ into the light. And this is what we want to do at Weimar. This is our mission. Notice one of the things we mentioned is part of our music major, we have a performance major, but it's unlike any other performance majors you'll find. Because performance is not our main concern. It is worship. Because who is the object of our worship if not the Lamb? for what he's done for us. So with our voice and with our instrument, we praise him, but we also want to penetrate the hearts of those who are going through this world enveloped in darkness. And here's the problem with so many who are going through these uh, terrible things in life, whether it be illness, watching what's happening around the world, depression, anxiety being up all over the place, that a lot of people don't know how to deal with the darkness because they don't have the knowledge or understanding that there is a life after this one. That this isn't the end. So how do we tell them? Through the stories that we tell through our music, through our own witness, through our own experience. Because we are, we've been created to be voices for his agency. You all have been called for that. No matter what the gift is, share it. And don't be bashful about it. And God will multiply. He will. But as we... Continue to walk as pilgrims on this side of heaven towards the new Jerusalem. We walk in hope and in faith. Because it is only in struggle that we can really exercise faith. And in struggle we become strong. And this is where a lot of these hymns and anthems come from. From the faith of others who went on struggling through the darkness. And because of that, we have these hymns that can tell the story of redemption to a dying world. Christ is coming now. You know why I can say that? Look at the world around you and tell me that Jesus isn't coming. And I share Pastor Shin's uh, yearning in his sermon. I hope it's before 2090. I hope it's, I hope it's before 2030. Amen? I want to go home. It's time to get ready to go home, isn't it? Let's get ready to go home. These students you see here are preparing to go to a tour to New Zealand, one of the most secular countries in our world today, to bring light into the darkness. And unfortunately in this world, it takes money to get things done, but who is the owner of all things? God. God doesn't ask us to feed the 5,000. All he asks us to do is bring our loaves 
and our fish. And when we do, what does the lamb do? He multiplies and feeds the multitude. So we're invited to that. We're invited to that process. We don't feed. We just bring our loaves and fishes in faith and in hope that the Lord will do as he has done. And so tonight, in your programs, you'll see a little envelope. And in that envelope, you'll see a QR code. And you can also place um, your loaves and fish inside of that envelope. You can mail it in. You can t come and talk to us about how you want your donation to be used. You'll see that there are plans for the music department in the coming years. And as long as the Lord has us here, we continue walking, walking in that hope. But walking with support and prayers from our brothers and sisters like you. Because it's because of brothers and sisters like you that programs like this exist. We can't do it without the body. In fact, if you go to Acts chapter 4, do you want to see the church at work? Who the true church is? In Acts chapter 4, what happens? Peter and John have come back from being imprisoned, and they're rejoicing about it. Can you imagine coming home from prison? Would you be, well, you'd be happy to be home after, uh, after all. But going through the sufferings of Christ, they were excited about it. They finally had reached that moment when they understood what it meant to suffer for Christ, and they all gave their lives for Christ gladly in the end. And so, what did they do? They prayed with those that had been converted. And when they prayed, what happened? The Holy Spirit came down, again, came, came down on them a second time. And then, if you read verses 30 and on, what does it say? They were of one mind and one heart. And what did they do in response when they received the Holy Spirit? They gave of what they had so no one lacked. That's the church. Amen? That's what the church is supposed to be. And so we ask and we pray that you'll join us in this mission to help our students to be able to go and be the light in the darkness by giving your loaves and your fish. As we end tonight, we thank you for your presence, for what you're able to give. And as we share this last anthem of our Christian heritage, Amazing Grace, let us envision and imagine in our minds the day when we'll be able to sing this anthem together before the throne.
want to thank you so much for joining us this evening uh, to the Fresno Central Church, the pastor and the leadership. And Weimar University exists to educate and train a generation that will take the gospel to the world before Jesus comes and to heal a hurting world. And we want to thank you for your, your prayers and, and your support. Uh, let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your amazing grace, for grace and mercy that we don't deserve. And we thank you for the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. And I pray for every person that's come here tonight. You know our burdens and our cares. We claim the promise that what you've started in our lives, you will be faithful to complete. Bless us with your presence. But we ask these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I was certainly very blessed tonight. Was I the only one? Are there more out there that uh, were blessed? Yes. Would you like to say, thank you, Weimar? Thank you, Weimar. Uh, that was not good. Let's do it again. One, two, three. Thank you, Weimar. Thank you. And thank you, Jesus, for Weimar. You guys are amazing. By God's grace. So continue the hard and good work. I would like to ask Pastor Daniel Miranda to have a last prayer to bless our friends who came to bless us with their gifts. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are in heaven. Today we have experienced a foretaste of that heavenly choir and the joys that you have in store for us. And we pray, as we heard in the message today, that we may set our priorities right. And thank you, Lord, for Weimar University. Thank you for this orchestra, the choir. I pray for this ministry, that you may continue to bless the students and those who are directing this wonderful music ministry that will be used by you to touch many hearts. I pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.